Romans chapter 8, and this morning we're going to be touching on an aspect of spiritual warfare that is uh, oftentimes overlooked when we deal with the issue of spiritual warfare. If I was to use that term in any Christian setting, you might automatically start thinking of uh, the devil and demons. And yet, I believe that much of the spiritual warfare that a Christian will ever engage in is going to be the war that they face against their own self, their own sinful flesh. Paul is touching on that. He's been dealing with it a little bit, and this morning as we enter into Romans chapter 8, it's in full view. The Apostle Paul has just introduced to us uh, the fact, if we didn't know it already, that uh, within the believer is continual war. If you go back to chapter 7, verse 23, he uses the word war there when he talks about this law in his members, these body parts that are warring against the law of his mind and bringing him into captivity to the law of sin which is in his body, his members. That's wartime terminology there. Now the reason for the war that Paul is addressing is that God's Holy Spirit has taken up residence within our body, <laughs> our flesh. Physically speaking, there's a spirit inside uh, that is holy, uh, for the Christian anyway, and that Holy Spirit is forced to live within the realm of a completely unholy and corrupt flesh. Verse 18 of last week's chapter, Paul said, I know that in me, my flesh, nothing good dwells, nothing whatsoever. So entirely un, uh, unholy and corrupt, and yet the Holy Spirit dwells within upon conversion. So these two entities, the Holy Spirit and the unholy flesh, could not be more repulsed by each other. If you think that the Holy Spirit loves your sinful flesh, I don't, I don't agree with that. Uh, I know for certain that my sinful flesh hates the Holy Spirit's presence. Doesn't want him around. Doesn't want to deal with him. Galatians chapter 5 verse 17 says, Your flesh craves evil, which is just opposite of what the Holy Spirit wants. God's Holy Spirit in us gives us desires that are opposite of what your sinful flesh wants. So these two forces are constantly fighting. For the believer, these two forces are constantly fighting. They're at war, and there's a lot at stake in this war. That's why the Apostle Peter warns us to stay away from sinful desires, because they, quote, wage war against your very soul. It's your soul that's being attacked, and the Spirit of God fights back. Continual warfare. And so, uh, as we go along in the New Testament, uh, we have clarification given to us as to what the level of aggression on our part needs to be in order to win this war. We are told to crucify our flesh, the enemy. Okay? That is what it takes if we're going to win this war. Crucify. Th 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 that term suggests murder, destruction absolute death to the enemy. Okay? Crucifixion is a term that Paul is borrowing from the uh, age in which he lived, whereby Romans would execute their own criminals in the most uh, heinous of ways. Uh, crucifixion was designed to inflict the maximum amount of pain and uh, prolong the suffering as long as possible in those that had broken Roman law. We're told to do that to our flesh, if our flesh should ever so dare as to break God's holy law. Crucify it. Now, an unbeliever knows nothing of this war. Nothing. Because they aren't inhabited by the Holy Spirit, like the Christian is. The indwelling Holy Spirit is exclusive and unique to Christians only. If you are not born again, you have no idea what I'm talking about, though you may, in your carnal mind, mistakenly believe you understand. I assure you, you don't. The unbeliever does not understand because they don't have the Holy Spirit. They do not have the mind of Christ. And because there is nothing truly holy about them, 
And because they're so preoccupied with other things rather than the war between the spirit and the flesh, instead of crucifying the flesh, unbelievers pacify the flesh. They don't like what their flesh sometimes does. They certainly don't like the trouble their flesh gets them into. And so they try to subdue it with certain measures. They try to pacify it, but never will they crucify it like Christians do. That's why the life of an unbeliever is so often driven by emotion. That's why the life of a believer is so often marked by sensuality and overindulgence. They're just trying to pacify the flesh, that's all. There is nothing within them by way of holiness, which is common only to Christians, whereby their sinful impulses are restrained. There's nothing to hold them back from pursuing what their sinful flesh wants, except maybe their conscience, which doesn't always work. Okay, that's an amen right there. I just fill in the blanks. Maybe criminal law. That might stop them. I think, I think it stopped one or two people from murdering somebody that they hated. And even then, criminal law doesn't always work to stop the flesh. Maybe morals, good morals might work to kind of curb those behaviors. Maybe mom and dad and their presence and influence in your life will get you to clean up your act a little bit. But the Christian has the Holy Spirit. That is without exception. That's a universal truth. All that are born again in Christ are provided with God's indwelling spirit. That's why then, in every Christian, is a constant battle. It is a, by definition, holy war. Spirit against flesh. Holiness versus corruption happening inside of you. It's all because God's Holy Spirit has taken up residence, permanent residence, within the scope of that unholy environment that the Apostle Paul calls your flesh. And both sides of that contest are relentless and unyielding. They will not give up. That's both encouraging and discouraging. Isn't it? Your flesh will never stop fighting. It will never Wave the white flag. Oh, how discouraging. But neither will the Spirit of God, never will he surrender to the flesh and call it quits. And so, congratulations, Christian. When you were born again, you were born into war. And I reminded you last week that after 22 long years of devout Christianity, even the Apostle Paul was still at war. And he confessed to you and I his ongoing struggle in chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. I'm going to read it for you again. He says, What I'm doing, I don't understand. Because what I want to do, that I don't practice. But what I hate, that I do. If I then do what I don't want to do, okay, then I agree with the law that it's good. But now it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin that dwells in me. Because I know that in me, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Because to will, to want, to desire is present within me, but how to actually perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I want to do, I don't do. But the evil I don't want, that's what I practice. But now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, like the Apostle Paul, you and I should be ever growing and maturing. That's what sanctification is meant by. It's, that's, that's what we're called into. When the Holy Spirit moves in, he, he initiates a process from day one whereby you, over time, become more and more Christ-like. Not less and less, more and more. It may be three steps forward, two steps back, but the ongoing overall trajectory of your life is Christ-likeness. That's called sanctification. So look for that, Christian. Look for that in your life. It should be present. Overall, your life should be marked by growth and maturity. But I'll tell you this, nobody, not one of you, not even me and not the Apostle Paul, is ever going to mature themselves out of combat. 
If you are living under the illusion that maybe one day in the future you will somehow plateau and all of your struggles against sin are just going to kind of disappear because you're so Christ-like, that won't happen. After 22 years, Paul the Apostle is still wrestling with these sins, these petty little trite obstacles that get in his way from wholly serving Christ and following Jesus then you, you shouldn't expect that either. Okay? You will never mature out of combat. You will never be in this life free from that internal conflict that Paul explains in verses 15 through 20. And sometimes, guys, you will find, and I'll bet, because I'm, I'm really discerning, I'll bet you've already found that at times the flesh gets the upper hand. You're not always walking in the Spirit. You're not always nice to be around. You're not always exactly holy. Again, that, that's worthy of an amen, so inside I'm going, amen. Well, that's why the Apostle Paul begins chapter 8 like he does. There is therefore now no condemnation. There is none. To those who are in Christ Jesus, he has to clarify there is condemnation to those who are still yet outside of Christ. There, are, there is very much condemnation to those who are religious, even Christian, but not born again. He says, but to those who are truly in Christ, and I'll get to what that means in a moment, but to those who are in Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit, because the law of the Spirit is life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. He says, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did. God did it. God was able to accomplish something in you and I that law never could, rules never could. God could have written down 613 plus 1,050 combined into two testaments called Old and New. Oh, wait, he did. And those can accomplish nothing in you apart from God. So what the law couldn't do, God did. How did he do it? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He became a human being, still divine, yet 100% human on account of sin. That's why he came. It was because sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. There is a war going on inside of us, and if we do not have God's help, we're going to lose. And that's exactly why Christ came, to fight alongside of us by imparting to you and I the Holy Spirit, who is quite a soldier. Quite a soldier. Okay. There is no condemnation. He uses this word, which is unique to the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. He uses it three times, twice in chapter 5, the last time here at the beginning of chapter 8, and it's a judicial sentence. We have foregone a guilty verdict. That part is gone. We haven't even reached judgment day yet, but I can already tell you what will happen for those who are in Christ when judgment day comes. They won't even go to court. They've been exonerated before their date even arrives. And there is no punishment for us. There is no penalty if indeed we are in Christ. Now, that term in Christ refers to a person's positional standing in the sight of God. So if God recognizes faith in you, saving faith, real faith, faith that fits the biblical definition, if he sees that in you, once he recognizes that, and he's waiting, he's waiting on the entire human race. One by one, people are demonstrating faith in Christ all over the world. And when that happens, they are, by God's definition, in Christ. God decides when that happens, not you. You can't decide it by praying a prayer or walking the aisle or signing a card or doing some good deed. God decides, and he's waiting until he sees faith. Of course, when that happens, now we are in Christ. This is a favorite term used by the Apostle Paul. He uses it over 200 times in his letters in the New Testament. In Christ, in the Beloved, in Him, referring to Christ. And it's been explained in a way where, if you know how it works with a will, uh, a person's uh, living will and testament, right? They die, 
and that will includes certain people who then have a legal right to the inheritance that the deceased left behind. This works itself out in the gospel wonderfully. Jesus died and left us with an inheritance. Those who are in his will are guaranteed his inheritance. And so just as a person could be in a will, they have a legal status for that inheritance. If you're adopted, you're in a family, right? If you're married, you're in covenant. Well, if you're born again, you're in Christ. And when you're in, you can never be out. Okay. So the explanation there is helpful for you and I. It tells us here then that the outcome of our case has already been decided. And the reason is given in verse 3 of today's text. God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and he condemned sin, not us. There's no longer any condemnation for us who are in Christ because when Christ came, he condemned sin. That's wonderful. I don't want to go to hell, but my sin can go to hell, right? And so I'm not condemned, but my sin is, and I got no problem with that. I hate my sin. Christians hate their sin. And Christians are dogged by their sin all their life. They don't want anything to do with it. So if that's what gets condemned, no problem. I don't mind if that fries. God can torture and, and abuse my sin all that he wants for all of eternity, just as long as I'm separated from it, which I am, because my sin is not me, and I am not my sin. And Paul made that very clear in chapter 7, verses 17 and verse 20, when he said, it's no longer I who do these things, it's the sin that's in me. Different entity. My sin can go to hell. There is no condemnation for me. In verse 4, we're told that the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us. That's crazy. I can't imagine that if I was being judged by a Duluth court of law, that they would ever look at my life and say that I have fulfilled all requirements of the law, because, good grief, I just simply haven't. I mean, sometimes your pastor, get this, speeds you do too, so we're fair. But listen, all of God's righteous requirements have been fulfilled by <clears throat> me? I know the truth. I know that they haven't, yet we're told that in Christ they are. And by the way, what are the, re what are the righteous requirements of God's law? Perfection. Absolute perfection. Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, he said this to those in his day, unless your, and I'll say this to you in 2021, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the most righteous within your purview, you'll be in hell. You have to be better than the best. So I don't know if that excludes us all. But just a few verses later, Jesus clarifies and says, be perfect like God is. Well, that's daunting. That's, you know, I mean, I, I can look at maybe somebody else in, in my generation and go, well, I think I'm better than them and him and her and I'm pretty much everybody. And then Jesus goes, are you perfect like God is perfect? And to that, I must confess I'm not. That's a no-brainer. You got to have quite an ego to think that you're upstanding as the Lord God is. He requires perfection. His law requires perfection. That perfect standard that God will measure men and women by is made very clear in the law. All you have to do is read the Bible. But now you and I, through faith in Jesus Christ, faith in his work, the work that he accomplished while he was alive and the work that he accomplished by dying, along with the work that he accomplished in resurrection, which, by the way, is work that you could never do, you could never live the life that Christ lived. You could never die for reasons he did. You could never bring yourself back to life, <laughs> right? Like maybe you could pull off the first two, but bring yourself back from the dead. Houdini couldn't even do that, though he said he would, because you can't. And so we put our faith in what Jesus did, because he, he could and, and did. Then God's righteous requirement is fulfilled and your righteousness does exceed 
the righteousness of those who are most righteous. And you are perfect like God is. If you have faith in Christ. And so now, for those who are born again, it's the imperfect flesh of a Christian that's liable for that Christian's sin. Not the Christian themselves. God declared the Christian perfect. It's your flesh that has the problem. And by the way, your flesh will die. And your flesh will rot. But praise God, you will be given an entirely new, perfect, glorious body for that spirit, the real you, to live in for eternity. You would never want to live the rest of your life in this body. If you think you would, you're not old enough yet. Yeah, think about it. You'll start to wear out. You'll get wrinkles. Things will sag. It's just the way that it is. You maybe haven't suffered debilitating injury yet. Nobody would want this body forever. And God says, I promise I'll give you a new one. I didn't like this one anyway. I'm going to kill it. And your spirit will live on in a body that is equipped to live for eternity. So, we're promised here that the war is already won, so to speak. It's over. We've already been declared victors. We will win. Christians through Christ, in Christ, will win the war they fight. Even though we still sin sometimes, no punishment is going to be incurred by the sins we commit. So we can just relax then, right? Oh, whew. I guess the war is won. So psh, sin away, kids. Like, what if the sermon ended right there? Wouldn't that be sad? Like, because if you're a true Christian, you're just, like, eager to hear how we can win this war. Like, the war is won, I get it, but bleh, you want victory over sin, not on Judgment Day, you want victory over sin, like, a half an hour ago. Well, it's true that just because the overall war against sin and death is ultimately won, that doesn't mean that the current battle that you face against your sin can't, can't be lost. And you know that's true because on a day-to-day -day basis, we oftentimes lose those battles. There still is, even though the war is won, a, an internal, unceasing brawl between flesh and spirit that goes on within the believer. And, of course, that hasn't ceased yet. Uh, because being possessed by a Holy Spirit, and the key word there is holy, since you have this tinge of holiness inside of you, brought by none other than the Holy Spirit himself, being possessed by that Spirit makes you want more from salvation than to be simply freed from the penalty of sin. You want to be freed from the power of sin too. Anybody who's born again in Christ and has been forgiven in the eternal sense very much wants to be freed in the current, present tense. Listen, I, I'm grateful to Jesus Christ that I'm saved and that I've got a home in heaven. And I look forward to the day because I know that it's eventual, but it isn't right now. It's a reality that I'm not enjoying, not when I'm still at war against my sin. I need to fight the battles, day-to-day -day battles, even though the ultimate war has been won. And I'll tell you that the outcome of the daily battles that you face as you go it is going to be decided by the quality of the daily relationship that you have with that spirit. The outcome of the daily battle that you fight against any sin is going to be decided by the quality of the daily relationship that you have with that spirit, which makes no other relationship in this world as important as the one that you have with God's spirit. Protect it. Nurture it. Cultivate it. In the end, he is your only ally, even against yourself. You will betray you 
you are always looking to betray yourself. You will always throw yourself in front of the, the, the sin. The... Be careful. You'll lie to yourself. Did you know that? There's nothing more deceitful than your own heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? You can. You can. You will lie to yourself. You will betray yourself. You will sin against yourself. You will sabotage yourself. But the Holy Spirit never will. So nurture the relationship you have with him. Paul writes in verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now he's getting into a lot of spirit terminology, flesh and spirit. I think he uses the term flesh nine times in this morning's passage. Uh, I could be wrong. Uh, but I do know that so far, in regard to the term spirit, so far in this book, we've covered seven chapters to date. In the first seven chapters, Paul has referenced the Spirit five times. That averages out to once every about chapter and a half. He's mentioned the Spirit once every chapter and a half until today. Today, he ups the average to once per verse. Seventeen times in seventeen verses. So it should be pretty obvious to even you and I, the average reader, before we dig any further, what the dominant theme is in the first 17 verses. And he's not going to let off the gas pedal either. It's the Holy Spirit who is in focus. And the reason being is because the Holy Spirit's presence in a person's life isn't just the reason for the conflict that they face as Christians. Like, he's the reason. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be having this battle all the time. We would just be unholy and corrupt. Kind of that would be our natural trajectory, right? That's your factory setting. You're unholy and corrupt. You have a sinful nature. But then once you're born again and the Holy Spirit lives in there, he's the reason for the conflict. If you want to praise God for anything today, praise him for war. Now, yeah, you get to, you get to battle, 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 battle. It's his fault but I wouldn't change anything. Thank God that he brings me, introduces me into that new life where I can fight against sin and not constantly lose. Well, the reason the Holy Spirit is in plain view this morning is not only because the Holy Spirit is the reason for the conflict we face, but he's also the secret to victory in our day-to-day -day battle. So you may be upset about the arrangement. Go ahead and get rid of him then guaranteed failure. I would rather lose an occasional battle than to be defeated in the war. And so Paul is going to be dealing with the Holy Spirit here because it's good for us. He says, those who live according to the flesh and set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Uh, he was talking about walking in the Spirit already in verse 1. Uh, he talks about walking uh, in the flesh or the spirit in verse 4, and, and he uses this terminology of walk or live according to, and really they are synonymous. Uh, but the term walk here is a direct reference to conduct. It's how you live. If you walk according to the flesh, your conduct reflects that. It's, it's your lifestyle is marked by fleshly desires and fleshly pursu sinful pursuits. Uh, okay? Uh, if you walk in the spirit, your, mark, your life is marked, of course, by spiritual things, honoring God, uh, obeying Jesus Christ, and all the rest. And so your life always, this goes for anybody, whether they're born again or not, the life of every man and every woman is always in the process of producing fruit. Whether that fruit stems from the ultimate root of flesh, <clears throat> or that fruit grows out of the root stock of spirit, your life is always producing something, fruit of some kind. Now, I want to draw your attention to Galatians chapter 5. The apostle writes to a cluster of churches in that region, and he clarifies this differentiation between the fruits that are produced by the flesh and the fruits that are produced by the spirit. 
In verse 19 of that book, in chapter 5, he says, "...the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness." Now, I want to just touch on that because all four of those initial sins that he begins this list with are sexual in nature. Now, adultery and fornication are fairly evident in their definition. Adultery is sexual sin committed outside of wedlock. Fornication is sexual impurity that is committed before wedlock is even formed, premarital. But it goes on and talks of uncleanness and lewdness, both of which fall also under the category of sexual sin. Now, they don't necessarily involve intercourse per se, but these are sexual in nature, perversion and lewdness, uh, all of those things that gratify the sexual lust within the sinner, uh, whether they include technical intercourse or not. Uh, this covers the entire gamut. And why does Paul start with four categories of sexual sin? Uh, the reasons may or may not be uh, simply because sexual sin is a dead giveaway as to a person's spiritual condition. Okay? I, I take it for what it's worth, but I believe that to uh, make yourself believe that God approves of any and all forms of sexual expression is to force your mind to accept what you know is a lie. There is something about sexual impurity that violates a person's body as well as a person's soul. So you start messing around in that category, you have done damage to yourself that you're unaware of. And that can very easily send your life spiraling into additional sins. Verse 20. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Like if he forgot anything, he just covers it all. Stuff like that, he says, which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, period. Man, have we gone astray from that in 2021. What church actually holds to Galatians 5 anymore? And Paul says, I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, you ought to hold to the truth of what's being said. We ought to do the same. Those who walk in the flesh can expect to produce fruit that was just listed for you. In Galatians chapter 5. What could we expect for those who walk in the Spirit? Well, he goes on and says in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. No one's forbidding you to love somebody. Did you ever notice that? There's no, there's no criminal law, no civil law that is forbidding you to be gentle. Or to control yourself. That's why laws are there for when you don't control yourself. For when you hate instead of love. And the hate gets the best of you. That's why laws are there. But there's no law against the fruits of the Spirit. And I'll tell you this. Those fruits will be produced inevitably by anybody whose rootstock is the Spirit. Just as the former list, those fruits of the flesh, will be, I guarantee you, Produced by those whose rootstock is in the flesh. So we have two options, guys. We can walk in the flesh, or we can walk in the spirit. It's either or. It's like a light switch. A light switch can't be on and off at the same time. But I'll also say this. Oh, so often we give far too much attention to the outward, the behaviors that people can see, and too little attention to what's going on inside. And please understand this morning that outward conduct is only a reflection of who you are on the inside. That's why Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart, for it determines your course of life, your behavior 
is determined by what's inside. Everything you do flows from your heart. So the key to victory over the flesh runs deeper than mere behavior. The real test of your holiness and whether or not you operate by the strength of God's Spirit is proven not just in how you behave when you're around us, but in how you think at all times. Look at verse 6. Paul says, To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. In the last three verses, Paul has mentioned our mind four times. It's our mind now that's in plain view. He's addressing not just how we act, but now he wants us to consider how we think. That is crucial evidence of holiness that we need to see in both areas. You know why? Because your behavior can be modified at any given moment to fit your surroundings. In other words, you can fake it. Anybody can fake it. If you're in church, you'll act like you're at church. If you're at a concert, you're probably not going to act like you're at church. Put it that way. If you're at the bar, you're going to act like you're at the bar. If you're at a company Christmas party, you're going to act like you're at the company Christmas party. If you're at Adventure Zone, right, you're going to act like you're at Adventure Zone. You're going to shoot people with lasers. That's what you do at Adventure Zone. Okay? So we can modify our behavior. That's, that's no tall order there. But oftentimes we make the mistake of assuming that our thinking, our thinking doesn't need to be controlled. As long as we control our behavior, all is well. But we let our thoughts run amok with no concern over what it actually indicates about us. Guys, you could, you could hate the person right in front of you and still wear a smile on your face. It's not hard. Well, Paul informs us here that if we hope to win the battle against sin in our flesh. Now, just as I go, ask yourself this. Do you want to win the, ba- the day-to-day battle against sin in the flesh? Or do you, want, do you want your sins to control you? Do you want to keep failing? and Do you want to lose the battles? Do you, do you want sin to dominate your life? If the answer is no and you want to win, then, then guys, this is key. If we want to win the battle against sin, we must gain control of our minds. Most of us, we got behavior down. We got control of our behavior for the most part. We're adults. We can control ourselves. Good for you. Yes and amen. But I know for many of you, if not all, it's thinking that's the problem. Your thinking is the problem. And if you want to win over the sins of your flesh, you have to gain control of your mind. And I'll tell you, this is where real spiritual warfare happens. And I, I have to wonder how often the devil or demons get the blame for our failures when really it's not the devil or demons, it's the way they're thinking. It's the way that you're thinking. That's, that's why you're losing the battles. Because you think with an unguarded mind. Because you think with thoughts of envy and lust and revenge and whatever else panders to the flesh. Meanwhile, the spirit that's in you is quenched and grieved and neglected and forgotten and displeased, to say the least. You look at verse 8, it says, then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And so there you have this spirit in you that is sad and displeased and neglected, and, and you expect to experience Christian joy when you've got a person living inside of you, spirit form, that is sad, that is upset. And oh, we try, don't we? Don't we? I want to be a Christian that, that enjoys Christ and the Spirit in, in, inside, but also enjoys sin. And so you try to enjoy sin, and if you're born again, it's making you miserable. Which makes you probably the most miserable person on the planet, because you got too much of Jesus inside of you to enjoy sin anymore, and you got too much sin in your life to really enjoy the Spirit. 
it's terrible. If we want to win that skirmish, the daily struggles within, if we want to overcome sin, you must gain control of your mind. If you think of your brain as the control center of your life, like the capital city of a country, well, I'll tell you that if you can take control of your mind, then you can control the whole nation. If you can control the way you think, you can control your entire life. Isaiah 26, verse 3 says, God will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in him. That's a promise of God. It's a promise of God. He will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is steadfast and trusting in God. So, what happens then when our flesh does have the advantage? Because at this point, you gotta, you got to admit that we have days where we're losing the battle or have lost the battle or we have to try and recover after yesterday's battle was lost. We stumbled into sin. We did something that was wrong. We said something that was hurtful. There's always going to be that. Our thought life is all over the place. We aren't pure in here. We aren't pure in our heart. We aren't pure in our conduct. Something has really made us wonder whether the war is really won. Certainly none of us is expected to walk in the Spirit without fail. None of us has ever done it. And pretending to only makes it worse. <laughs> you know that, right? <laughs> You're only adding insult to injury. Like you know that you've stumbled and then yet you appear as if you haven't. That's called hypocrisy. God doesn't like it and God's people don't like it and you don't like it. So what do we do? When we've relapsed into those times where we walk in the flesh, we must remember that there is hope. That is not the time to give up, though the devil would have you give up. You can be assured that you are still winning the overall war, even though you may be losing or have lost a few battles here and there. I know that because of what the Scripture says in many places. One of those places is before us this morning in verses 9, 10, and 11. The Apostle Paul reminds us, even if we stumble, that we are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. This is a black and white issue. You're either born again or you're not. And if you are born again, the Spirit of Christ is in you even if you stumble. If the Spirit of Christ isn't there, then you weren't a Christian to begin with. He says in verse 10, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. He dwells in you. He is in you. Now, we're supposed to be in Christ. But Christ is also in us. And I want you to notice here in these last few verses how Paul's language shifted from our being in the Spirit to now the Spirit's being in us. So yes, we ought to be in Christ, and we ought to walk in Christ, and we ought to walk in the Spirit. But that doesn't always happen, not perfectly. We sometimes revert to the flesh. But for those who are in Christ, ha Christ is also in them. Christ is also in them even when we walk in the flesh. The Holy Spirit remains in us because we might leave him from time to time. We may fall off the path on which we're meant to walk, but he promises that he'll never forsake us. He will never forsake us. And that's a great reassurance to the Christian who's in sin, that even though he may have sinned, he will be brought to his senses once again. He will be granted repentance, and he will be restored to fellowship. 
That's evidence that the Holy Spirit is in that person and that that person is in Christ. There is an abiding spirit of holiness in there somewhere. Even if it is occasionally, temporarily masked by sin, there is still holiness crying out, rising up, overcoming, which is evidenced by, again, repentance and restoration. So that's why Paul can say in verse 9, you aren't in the flesh, but in the spirit. Because in the truest sense, you're not in the flesh, even if sin briefly gains control of your life. Even if you've lost the present battle, you repent, you regroup, and you return to the war. The overall, you lost a battle, but that doesn't mean the war has been lost. You return to the war so that you can keep fighting. These are three of the greatest evidences of whether a man or woman is born again through faith in Christ. Ready? Number one. Repentance from sin. Repentance from sin. This is like totally ongoing all the time. You look at a Christian, you will see repentance. They're constantly doing it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit won't let them not. You ever had that before? You did something, you were racked with guilt, and the Holy Spirit pressed you until you just said something, you asked somebody to forgive you, you just got it off your chest, you had to. That's because the Holy Spirit's like, ooh, mm. and you're like, okay, okay, okay. You thought sin was tough on you. There will be repentance from sin. There will be reconciliation to God. And yes, sin does mar, I won't say wreck, mar the relationship that you have with God. It won't erase it. It's still there. It's just not that great. And again, that, that drives a Christian bonkers so that they repent. They don't want the guilt. They don't want the, the wonky relationship with Jesus. They want it good again. And so they repent. And then they're reconciled to God. And in addition to that, they're also reconciled to man. You know a Christian when they cannot rest until the relationship is reconciled. Okay? Sometimes it's reconciled and everything's fixed simply by going to God just by going to God and God blesses and restores that fellowship because that's the third third indicator that a person is in Christ and that Christ is in them they are restored to fellowship if your relationships are always tumultuous if there is continual conflict in relationship hard to believe that there isn't sin in there somewhere that you've got problems problems with God problems with man check your heart why is it that way? If the Spirit of Christ was in you when you sinned, you'll know it. You'll know it when the Spirit of Christ brings you out of that sin. If the Spirit of Christ wasn't in you when you sinned, you won't come out of it. You may try to cover it up, you may try to eliminate it in your own strength. You may try to pretend that it's never there. You may try to defend it so you can keep it around. But the Spirit of Christ was never in you to begin with. If one of his own stumbles into sin, he will come to the rescue. It's just contrary to the nature of Christ and his own character to leave a wounded comrade there to die in a puddle of his own blood on the field of battle. In John 14, verse 18, Jesus said, I won't leave you orphans, I will come to you. And I believe that promise still stands for modern disciples like you and me. And so in spite, or I'm sorry, in light of Christ's loyalty to us, Paul writes the following in verse 12. He says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors. <laughs> we owe him. I mean, the, the least we could do for Christ is to show a little loyalty here. Okay? That we no longer walk in the flesh, but according to the Spirit, regardless of what it brings, regardless of the difficulty, regardless of the potential suffering, regardless of the, it doesn't matter. Do you understand what Christ has done for you? He says, therefore, brethren, we're debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Because if you, he goes on, if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. 
Like not only ought we do this for Christ out of love and out of appreciation and loyalty, but also to just avoid death. If you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. This usually gets the New Testament writers of Scripture really excited when they start talking about how we have become children of God. I remember the Apostle John wrote, how crazy is it that we are called children of God? Yeah, it's, it's wild that God would receive us into a relationship with himself whereby we're designated his own family. Like we, I mean, I know that we're made in his image, but we don't even resemble each other. I mean, I, are, we're relatives because I, I couldn't be anything more different than Jesus Christ than I think I am. And yet he says, oh no, we're brothers. We're, we're, we're family. And so the New Testament writers get a little excited about that. Paul is no different. He mentions it here. We are sons of God. It's a generic term meaning sons and daughters. We are children of God. But there is a, a condition on that. Uh, it's exclusive only to those who are led by the Spirit of God. Uh, you know you're a child of God if you are led by the Spirit of God. That's the connection there. How do you know that you're a child of God? Not by whether you walk in the Spirit, but what? by whether you're led by the Spirit. He was talking about walking in the Spirit, but not anymore. Now he's talking about being led by the Spirit, and there's a difference. There's a difference there. If our designation as a child of God rested on our walk in the Spirit, we'd be out, wouldn't we? We would be unadopted as soon as we were adopted because my walk is like this. Sometimes I'm in the Spirit and then 30 seconds later, I'm not. And then I'm in the Spirit again and then I'm not. But here, my designation as a child of God isn't contingent on how I do walking in the Spirit. It's that I'm overall led by the Spirit. I mean, even James admits that we all stumble in many ways, but thank God our designation rests on the fact that we follow or are led by Christ, not whether or not we stumble as we go. We are sons and daughters of God. And sons who love their fathers are always going to be found following in their steps, even if they trip. Take it from me, I'm a dad. In verse 15, he says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, indeed, we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. Now, I want you to notice there that suffering is assumed. Suffering is assumed. It's part and parcel to the Christian life. There will be suffering. You can imagine what is going to happen if you throw a piece of meat into a dog kennel. It'll be devoured. So too, you take a holy individual in whom resides God's spirit and put them in a dark and corrupt world. You think you're going to get out unscathed? Look at what happened to Jesus Christ. And you follow in his steps? It's no different than God dropping his Holy Spirit right dead center of you. Your flesh rears up against him and fights tooth and nail every step of the way. How can we avoid suffering, guys? It's going to happen. We're at war. And there's nothing comfortable about war. It's what we do. We fight. Sons who love their follow, father will be following him even if they stumble. Sons who love their father will be found following him even if it hurts. 
if we are children of God, our lives will be marked by warfare. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when all is said and done, the life of faith is an unending struggle of the Spirit with every available weapon against the flesh. That's Christianity. That's spiritual warfare. And that, friends, is the majority of the spiritual warfare you will ever encounter. It's the war you fight against yourself. If you can't win that, the devil doesn't need to bother with his time coming after you. You've destroyed yourself. The war is already won, yes, but if you will defeat yourself daily, every time a battle arises, the devil can move on to greater pursuits. I think, uh, generally speaking, in the Christian sphere, we rarely see ourselves as the enemy, but we are, and you need to take up arms against yourself because arms have been taken up against you. And I'll tell you this, you can win. You're not a victim. You're not a victim. You can win this fight against personal sin if you want to. Whatever your vice is, whatever the thing is that so controls you, whatever lust you've got, whatever problem there is, whatever issue you deal with most regularly and you see as most insurmountable, I'm telling you this morning that it can be one. The Spirit is willing. The Spirit is willing. And the Bible tells us that the flesh is weak. What that means is that we have a Holy Spirit and a weak enemy. We have a Holy Spirit who is on your side to fight against an enemy that Jesus calls weak. The flesh is weak. So guys, your flesh doesn't need to control you any longer. If the Holy Spirit is in control, your flesh will melt beneath his power. Paul wouldn't talk like this if victory over sin wasn't possible. He wrote in a different letter, I beat my body into subjection on a daily basis to keep myself from being disqualified from spiritual involvement. My body, my physical body, I put it under. I discipline it. I don't let it win. Guys, it's you against you. You're in the ring against yourself. And your own soul is the prize. Your very own soul is what you get for winning. And the key to victory has already been given. Galatians 5.16 says, Walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It's you against you. Who's going to win?